he was furious with them. And what would happen would be during the Shma, the Shmalakian War. So it's wars between the Protestants and the Catholics that we talked about before. Catholics defeated Zwingli, basically the theocracy he created in. Did I mention what city he was from? Did I mention what city Zwingli? Zurich. He was in Zurich. He was in Zurich, right there. Catholic forces defeated him with the help of the Lutherans. It tells you a lot about Luther. As older he got, the more intolerant he got of anybody who disagreed with him. And Zwingli would be killed during the battle. And so Zwingli, either his followers were greatly persecuted, and so they fled, and they became... There's a few remnants of that, but it became more molded into the general Protestant idea of Lutheranism. And the Anabaptists. One more group we have to talk to that was greatly, or talk about, that was greatly influenced, greatly influenced by Luther, were this group called the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists were different. This was mainly the lower class. These were the poor, the peasants. In fact, a lot of the hatred of the Anabaptists would be the same hatred, ha hatred of the Anabaptists by the wealthy was the same kind of hatred they had for the peasant rebellion. They're threatening our power. Those people, those princes who converted to Luther, they wanted to make sure that they're in power. Well, the Anabaptists were different. And what they believed is this. Once again, the Bible and education is important. Well, maybe not so much education, but the Bible. And in the Bible, Jesus was not baptized until he, until he was an adult. And so the Anabaptists said, you cannot be baptized and have it mean anything until you're an adult. Because you need to know what you did. If you're a baby, you have no idea what happened. You have no choice in this. It's a matter of choice that I choose, showing my faith, to be baptized as an adult. So that was the Anabaptist big deal. Baptized as an adult because you are an adult and can know what you're doing. And so, this is what we have to get. Therefore, it's voluntary. To the Anabaptist, you cannot make anybody become, make anybody become a, a Christian. They have to show their faith. And since you can't make anybody, they essentially, this is the next thing we have to get. They basically said, all of these controls by kings and princes and the church are invalid. They're invalid. There are no secular agreements that we are bound to. Since we make our own choices, princes cannot tell us what to do. We do not have to pay their taxes. We do not have to follow the rules. We will make our own rules. You can see the threat to the Anabaptists. In fact, in the city of Minster, oops, I didn't put this down. What is that idea? Minster. In Germany, huh? Yeah, the city's named after the cheese. <laughs> yeah, the cheese comes from there. That's kind of cheese. Good cheese. Huh? Should be. It's a U with umlauts. For me, that's a pretty good U. And Minster, they took over the town, and the name of the man was named John Leyden. And Leyden was a very intense Anabaptist. Excuse me. And he did a little bit like, I got this little cold that's coming on. I wonder if somebody who sat near my desk was sick and spread it. And it's a little bit like Calvin. Calvin did this whole thing where you're elect. It's already been decided whether you're saved or not, so you don't have to follow the teeth you know, those good works that the Catholic Church requires. Then what did Calvin do? He took over Geneva and told everybody how to act. That's what happened with Leighton. Leighton said, we are not bound to the rules of princes or kings. 
And then he took over Mead's and told everybody exactly how to live. That happens a lot. This idea of, I want religious freedom until I get religious freedom. Then I'll tell you what to do. I always think that's kind of funny. That's one of the reasons why the Netherlands would become such an economic power in about 100 years after this. They didn't do that. They basically said, come here and make money. And we won't bug you. And you go to the Netherlands, it makes sense. It's a very prosperous place and tall. So, what happened was this. This became a real threat to the princes. And both Lutheran and Catholics alike put this down by attacking Münster and killing, let me phrase that, butchering all of the Anabaptists they could find. And so, when they got there, they were crucified, the bodies would be hacked. That is a gruesome death. Can you see what happened to him? This must have been one heck of a wood carving. When they attacked and destroyed the Anabaptists, you see what he's doing? He's filleted, or he's, he's been skinned. You see that? He's been skinned. And then he's now, and that's being disemboweled. Here are Anabaptists being thrown into the fire. I find that interesting. They put him on a ladder. Laden would be crucified, put in a cage, and the cage brought up to the top of the cathedral in Münster, where they let the body stay till this day. If you go to Münster, in a cage are a bunch of bones. He's still there. And they destroy the Anabaptists. Now, there's still some remnants of the Anabaptists who did not go away. For example, have you ever heard of a group called the Mennonites? A lot of Mennonites would come to, let's see, well, they went to, they were kicked out of Germany, they went to Russia, then they left Russia because they wouldn't join the army, so they went to North Dakota. Where else would a Mennonite go? In North Dakota. So we all these German slash Russian Anabaptists in North Dakota. The Baptists that would come about at the end of the 18th century are related. The Quakers would be another one that would come from the Anabaptists. Uh, not quite as, as radical, but this is what Luther had brought. Once he started this, you have all these separations and breaks. No problem. So, these are the major religions in Western Europe by about 1600. And as you can see from this, we have Lutheran, it's still mostly Catholic, and then we have Calvinist groups. Calvinists, remember, they're more commercial centers and they wouldn't totally take over. But <coughs> here and in Scotland, a little bit in England, England's getting their own church, we'll talk about in a sec. But that's the major religions. Now, write down one more thing. I did not put this on here. When this happened, this upheaval because of religion, this fighting because of this, a witchy, a witchcraft scare spread across Europe. Something must be causing this disruption. Something must be causing the people to fight the way they are. These religious differences. What is taking them? Well, the idea, clearly, as we saw in that picture of Luther, I had to analyze another you know, Satan. But who are Satan's minions? Witches. And a witchcraft craze spread throughout Europe, looking for potential enemies. And obviously, we all know one very important thing. Women tempt men. They're the ones who cause evil. And I'm looking at you, oh yeah, yeah, we know this. We know this. Men would be perfectly fine without the influence of women. So women are immediately suspect. Now, as I'm saying, this is in my opinion, yeah, I know that, that's obvious. We're saying about thinking, I don't know if I agree with that. What power did women have? Did they have any legal power? Okay. Political power. No. Now, women had economic power. Women were necessary for the survival, but they had no social power. If you're going to pick on somebody, who do you pick on? Somebody who can't fight back. And they're already considered to be second class. It's already very much in the medieval tradition that women are the temptress of men. So it became a way to fight back against evil. 
at least 180,000 witches. And we know there are witches. Oh, yeah. We know. They got like molds and birthmarks. And also, if you tie them up and throw them in the water, what do they do? <laughs> If they sink, they're not a witch. And then they're drowned. But they sink, at least they die a holy death. You think I'm kidding? They would tie them up and throw them in a pond. If they sink, they're not a witch. Yeah, the life is a witch. Yeah, I know, it's awful. And if they float, they burn them. Or press them. The big one was pressing them to death. Put a board over them and just start putting rocks on. Now, this was horrific. And this shows the, the fear, the hysteria, and it's easy to accuse women. Women have very little legal rights. And think about what the advantage would be for the religious leaders or the, or the secular, the princes or kings. There's problems, there's war, there's suffering. It's not my fault, it's the witches! Prove me wrong. Okay, let's get them. And it's no coincidence that you have this witch craze because of change and people fearful of change. And it spread to the 13 colonies of the new United States, or soon to be the United States. Best known if you heard the Salem witch trials. And people think the Salem witch trials in the United States in 1692 is, it's talked about, and it's in the textbooks almost put it, like our American history textbook, we have a very good one for AP, the American history textbook for the American history just kind of says, and then there was a witch trial. Like it just all of a sudden they said, oh, by the way, there's witches. No, the idea spread from Europe, and it's no coincidence that they were thinking the same thing. There were Puritans, aka Calvinists. All right. So that is the religious, or that's another map. I took a little better map than what I showed you before. And we're not gonna talk about the tutors. I'll come back to this. We're going to very quickly talk about, I'll come back. There's Edward, Lady Jane Grey, poor Lady Jane Grey. The Counter-Reformation. Lady Jane Grey, that's a really sad story. The Counter-Reformation was the attempt by the Catholic Church to fight back against the Reformation. I mean, they could see it. You have all these sects. Okay, they defeated Swingley like by then, but Calvinism was spreading. Lutheran was pretty much dominating northern Germany and moved into the Scandinavian countries. Excuse me. It's coughing. Yeah. And the church decided we need to do something to prove that the church, more and more they started calling it the Catholic Church, because we're the real church. We need to prove. That was loud, wasn't it? We need to prove to the people and ourselves that we are the legitimate religion. We've got to bring these people back in. But there's a real fear that if the Catholic Church did not bring back the Lutherans, did not bring back the Calvinists, they might go to hell too. The leaders of the Catholic Church, as they're thinking, because we allowed this to happen. And so the big thing was is to make the Catholic Church fun again. Make it exciting, make it interesting, and show how great it is. And so I did not put him down, but I should have wrote his name down. Right there is right down the Jesuits. I wonder if something happened because I know I typed that in. I wonder if I can save it. The Jesuits. And the Jesuits would be created by this man right there, Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola was the founder of the society of, okay, it's a monastery, they're monks, but what their duty was, as Loyola saw it, was to go out and prove that the Catholic Church really is the church by making it worthwhile. And so the Jesuit priests went out to try to reform the church. 
smash out the corruption, and bring in new members of the church. It'd be the Jesuits who would follow the Spanish into New Spain to try to convert as many of the American Indians as possible to become Catholics. And the other thing about the Jesuits were this. Yes, we want people to become Catholics, but they went away from some of the dogma. They were more open to other ideas. And if you ever go into a southwestern United States church, ever go to a church in, let's say, New Mexico, you know, New Mexico is very much a very strong part of New Spain. It's remarkable when you go in there because there are elements in the really old missions of the religions of the Pueblos or the Hopi or the other people there. It's really remarkable how they took some of that and let them believe this or, or like incorporated into the Catholic Church as long as I can say, but you still believe the basic tenets of the Catholic Church. This is a big deal. They went from being, you must do exactly what we say, to we want more Catholics and we don't care. So think of the influence. And that spread all over New Spain. Where's the Pope from? Today. Where's he from? Huh? Argentina. Brazil's Pope, yeah. He's from Argentina. And so that's because of New Spain. Now, the Jesuits are also very harsh. So if they go into areas and it's still a uh, Protestant leaning, they would be the ones who would do the Inquisition. They would be the ones who would stamp out Protestantism. But they also set up schools, they set up, uh, they, they, uh, they tried to spread, as they saw it, education so we could, people could learn how to become Catholic. It's a big shift for the church. No one could read, now we better take advantage of that. So they really tried to stamp that out. And then, at the urging of Charles V, there's Charles V right here, at the urging of Charles V, now that might be the best picture of him, that really shows that chin. He said the church needs to have another great council. There have been big councils to reform the church. And it's going to be called, we'll get to Philippe in a, a second, the Council, of, the Council of Trent. Carlos, Charles V, convinced Paul, Pope Paul III, to do the Council of Trent. And here the idea was, Originally, it's going to be, we'll bring everybody in, including Lutherans and Calvinists, in. Well, of course, they're not going to go. They're at war. And so the only people who went are Catholics. And so it didn't totally change. I mean, they weren't going to make big changes. But it went on for a decade. Oops. Wow, that's where I had it. No wonder I'm all messed up. And at the Council of Trent, what they did is this. This is what we have to get. The Council of Trent, after bickering and fighting, they made it very clear that all of those church corruptions, especially indulgences and simony, those are now sins. They banned the two of the biggest ones. They also banned pluralism and absenteeism, but those are the big ones. In indulgence and simony. Big deal. And so what they said is, we were wrong in the past. Well, they didn't say that. What they said is, we misunderstood the word of God. And now we are more clear. We are hearing him better. They don't want to admit they're wrong. But then they also said the Catholic Church is supreme. The Catholic Church is supreme. So that's what you got here. They didn't change that. They still said, you're a heretic. You will be excommunicated if you do not agree with us. So, they didn't totally change, but that was the church effort. And one more thing, I know the bell is not ready to ring, but a new form of art came about called Baroque. And Baroque art, which is absolutely awesome, Baroque art was going to show the wonders and the glories of the church. And what they would do is these dramatic, bright, vivid paintings of religious scenes to show how wonderful the Catholic Church was. Baroque art 
It's advertising for the church. So make sure we get that. Advertising for the church. Let me show you a couple things for the bell rings. And so this is what's called, this is from, from Roman history, the rape of the Sabine women. There's a lot of these. And this is an artist by the name of Titian, and he drew these pictures of the chubby flying angels. It was a very prominent art. Uh, CFBs, very important. And here is Jesus coming out of the cross. And notice, notice the, the bodies are exaggerated. Elvis has a big belt buckle. You can see it all there. All right, so. Try your best to make it by without me. It's going to be tough. And we have three days of essays on the 7th, the 5th, and the 12th. So, thank you for noticing that. Thanks. Thank you for bringing those. Really cool. No, but I got it. Not next Friday. Come on. There, there you go. <coughs> I like this game. It's really so fun. Huh? What game is it? It's an usher room. Do you do? <laughs> that's a funny game, you know. They that's funny how those games happen. You know, they, they got them really, you know, really complex. Oh, yeah. And now the funnest games, the ones that game, the games that people seem to play are the ones that are the most simple right now. <laughs> I think it's funny. Well, they do. It's weird. I guess it's one game where the whole thing is you just tap a cookie to get more cookies. And then you you spend those more cookies on ways to get more cookies, and that's basically the whole thing. I just tap the cookies, you can make more money for each one. Really? Yes. And you play this game? Yes, I play.